Okay, so let me start today's colloquium. It's an honor to have Professor Tom Lubinsky with us today. And uh, he's currently a Christopher H. Brown Distinguished Professor at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, he's kind of not a person, that he doesn't need any introduction in condensed matter or in any other general physics community. He has uh, received his, Professor Lubinsky received his BS from physics, BS in physics from the Caltech in 1964 and MA and PhD from Harvard in 69. And after a postdoctoral stint at Orsay, he, he and, and Brown University, he joined University of Pennsylvania in 71. And then he has been there ever since. And uh, Professor Lubensky received Oliver E. Buckley Condensed Matter Prize for his semical contributions to the theory of condensed matter systems, including the prediction and elucidation of the properties of new partially ordered phases of complex materials. And uh, uh, more, more so the graduate students and us know him through his uh, famous textbook principle of condensed matter physics, which he co-authored with uh, Paul Chicken at uh, NYU. So it's a pleasure to have uh, Professor Lubensky with us and he's going to talk about metamaterials and topological mechanics. Uh, the floor is yours now. Okay, thank you for the introduction. So this is always strange to be uh, giving a talk to your own uh, slides. It takes a little getting used to. Um, so I'm going to talk about metamaterials and topological mechanics today. I'm sure that many of you at uh, CCNY know about uh, electronic topological materials, but uh, topological mechanics uh, has a lot to do with it. And I must say that uh, we've, I could not have figured out what we started doing without Charlie Kane's help. All of the other, of my other collaborators, when I said this system, these mechanical systems could have uh, topological properties, they laughed at me. Charlie did two for two years. And then finally, one wonderful afternoon, we spent two hours together and, and Crack the thing. So you can see the list of people who, with whom I've worked. My postdoc, Xiaoming Mao, her husband, Kai Sun, graduate student, Anton Susloff, longtime postdoc of mine, Olaf Stelm, Daniel Sussman, Zed Rockland, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, James Clerk Maxwell is a big player. So, um, you know, as you know, there's been a lot of progress in electronic uh, topological properties. And the other thing that's really happened in the last few years, you know, 10 years or so that's hit the limelight are metamaterials. And these two together actually make a fairly nice story, which I hope to tell you about a little bit. So I'm going to start, this is a colloquium, so, you, you know, more pictures than equations, though that by the end, I will have more equations that you probably want to see. Uh, anyhow, so meta, oh dear, I'm not going to be able to advance. I thought I was able to advance. Oh dear. Oh, I see. Okay, I can do it that way. Good. Okay, so, so metamaterials are materials that are constructed by man. Uh, that uh, They're materials that don't occur naturally in, in nature. And we typically try to make them to do things that are useful. So the, the first uh, metamaterial that I know of is this negative index of refraction system, which uh, basically causes shielding in, in the microwave. So, the, the, you know, the length scale... Let's see, can you see my, yeah. Can, can you see this pointer moving around there? Yes. Yeah, yeah. good. So, so, so the, you know, this length scale is, is a couple of centimeters or centimeter. It's in the microwave and you set up these, uh, uh, you know, closed circuits so you can have magnetic fields and do things like end up with a negative index of refraction. Uh, a, more, a more recent version of that is these two dimensional systems where you create patterns that have some chirality and the chirality will then have uh, uh, desired effects upon the electromagnetic uh, radiation. Here we're talking about frequencies in the 10 to the third to 10 to the fourth Hertz. And there are, there are hundreds if not thousands of these things now. Um, these however are made really, they're very macroscopic. You could go in and you know, make the structures with your knife, but over the last several years, they figured out ways of you know, bringing these uh, uh, metamaterial constructions down to a much smaller length scale. Um, so 3D printers are the things that, that really have changed things. You know, typically what you have in a 3D printer is uh, say a system where you have two different reservoirs of polymers and you feed them uh, drop by drop 
onto the template that you, you want to, to reproduce and you can create almost anything. I mean, here, the, the, here you, you, you heat things up and it, it, they flow easily and you cool it down. Um, a lot of the uh, 3D printers actually use a uh, photo uh, polymerization method. And here you can see they, they created a whole series of uh, Eiffel Towers by putting that in a vat with polymerizable uh, fluids and you then shine light on it at the, exactly the right spot and you solidify things. You can make all of these crazy looking uh, structures, including uh, uh, you know, th this famous, uh, okay, remind me of the artist. Uh, you know, shoes. Uh, Escher. Escher. Escher, Escher, there we go, Escher, right. Uh, you can make uh, prosthetics and artificial ears and things like that. I obviously am not going, not interested in these things per se, but the methods that are used are, are quite useful. Um, actually, what really struck me is the, to what extent to which it's entered the, the, the real industrial world. This is a part of the GM, uh, G Safran and CFM joint venture to make what's called the LEAP engine. This is the most advanced new generation of electric engines. And they have a part here, which was, was designed for maximum efficiency of the engine. And they found that to, to construct it with standard, uh, what, what you call subtractive manufacturing, where you use a lathe and a, and a milling machine, required 20 parts to be welded or uh, brazed together. It was almost impossible to make, and it was too expensive to actually produce. And one of the leaders of uh, GE at the time, this Mohammed Fashami, uh, thought maybe 3D manufacturing would work. And it turned out that, uh, that uh, GE had a relation with a Cincinnati company, which was leading, at that time, the, the leading uh, manufacturer in the US using 3D printing. And they were able to produce this thing with far fewer parts. It was 25% less weight and five plus times as durable. And it's in all of these new machines now. You can, it's, it's, it's really quite remarkable. Um, let's not have to do it this way. So before I get to the uh, 3D printing that is uh, relevant to what I'm interested in, what I'm interested in are mechanical materials that are designed to have certain responses. You know, for example, this bridge that goes back to 1848 is a stable, is a structurally stable system. These triangles that are put together like this mean that uh, you know all of the stresses are taken care of, and you don't have to worry about uh, um, you know breakdown. Uh, this is a schematic of that that uh, bridge. I remember when I was a freshman at Caltech, we, we did a little bit of statics, and we were given problems like this to calculate the stresses given the forces on the bonds. And it always worked that you could find the answer. You know, most of the time when you apply a stress, you have to calculate the mechanical response of the individual struts. But for this particular configuration, if I give you the force, we can find out what the tension or the compression in the rods are, simply because there is a balance between the number of degrees of freedom and the number of constraints you have on the system. And this was first pointed out by Maxwell in 1864, when he, made, when, when he asked the question, you know, under what circumstances are structures like this mechanically stable? And he said, okay, well, we, we have nodes where we put together struts and we can think of those nodes as points that can move and each point, each uh, you know, joint here can uh, move in, in D dimensions, in three dimensions, or let's think in two dimensions to make it simple. And, um, so, so the number of degrees of freedom that you worry about here are simply the number of, uh, of hinges or, or number of uh, joining points times the spatial dimension because each one can move into two dimensions or, or not. And then each of the struts provides a constraint which reduces the number of degrees of freedom. So you can say this is going to be stable when the number of degrees of freedom as counted by the, the node structure here is equal to the number of constraints, which is the number of bonds. So uh, in, in this bridge, to complete the structure, you have to pin one end here 
and I don't know if you've ever looked at these bridges carefully, at one end, there are wheels that allow it to move in the horizontal direction so that the total number of forces and the total number of constraints just balance. So this is really the basis of a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about. Simple counting to see whether or not what the modes of a system are and what the, uh, you know, how stable it's going to be. So these are mechanical metamaterials now that are produced uh, you know, in, in material science departments and uh, metallurgy departments around the country. You can see you can do all kinds of things. Look at the uh, length scale on this. Th this line right here is 300 microns. So you're getting cells. This is made out of, uh, well, th th there are two different ways of doing the uh, additive manufacturing, the polymeric polymerization that, that I showed you earlier, or you can have a vat of uh, little tiny marbles of the material in question that you just heat up uh, preferentially and you can then cause uh, the, the fusing uh, of uh, different patterns that you've put on there. And you know, so, so here, here are examples of it. This one goes down to see that this is probably 250 microns. So, so you've got a, a cell size that is of order you know, 50 to 100 microns or maybe even less than that. Uh, this one, this particular version right here is going to play a role in what I discussed. This you can see is a diamond lattice made of struts, which are constructed so that they have a very high, uh, or rather low compression, high compression modulus. They're very hard to compress, but it's set up so that there's a different material at the node here, which makes it very easy to bend the structure. If there were no bending forces, then this would be a diamond lattice and a diamond lattice with only central forces has, is uh, stable with respect to isotropic compression, but it'll shear in all directions. So there's a little bit of a shearing force at these points, which prevents the thing from collapsing, as you can see right here. It, it, it's, but it's very easy to, uh, to move it around. The, and the, the engineers are, uh, who, who deal with this call this a pentamode system because of the six elastic degrees of freedom that the system has, five of them are very soft and are called the, the you know, one of the pentamodes, one of the modes of the pentamode. Okay, so that is an introduction to, now do I, can I go backwards? No, I can't go backwards. Oh dear, what am I gonna do now? Oh, this is awful. Uh, Actually, there I have is to tell you that, on the lower bottom. Uh, excuse me? There might be some arrow on the lower bottom of your screen somewhere. Oh, no, I'm only going forward. Oh, shoot. I was afraid this was not going to work. This oh, is a no, no, there is a there is a button I can see. Yeah. Here. yeah. Oh, there yeah, we please. go. Yes. Thank you. It's a bit ah, small. Okay, good, good. This, this, uh, this is coming to you from my work computer. I am at my home office and I'm doing that because the, I don't have the fonts on my, my home computer that will show the Greek letters here. So I'm gonna be interested in materials that are similar in spirit to that bridge I showed you that Maxwell was interested in, where the number of degrees of freedom is equal to the number of constraints in the system. So typically what you have is uh, N sites in a system that you can move in D dimensions. So I have uh, N, D N degrees of freedom. And we want to look at lattices where the D N degrees of freedom is equal to <clears throat> the number of constraints. And the number of constraints is just the number of bonds. So if I <coughs> ask under which conditions that is, uh, the number of, of uh, bonds is, is related to the number of nearest neighbors that these particles has, the, the, the number of sites that each site is connected to. Uh, so if I set Z equal to 2D, then the number of bonds is equal to, uh, excuse me, it is, the, the number of bonds is the number of sites 
times uh, half the number of nearest neighbors. So if the, what we want are lattices where the number of nearest neighbors of each site is equal to twice the dimensionality. And the, you know, the most familiar of those would be a square lattice. Here I have four, four neighbors per site uh, in the lattice. And so I have a situation where dn is equal to nc and we act under periodic boundary conditions, we, we satisfy the constraint, the number of degrees of freedom is exactly equal to the number of constraints that the system has. Now, we eventually relax the constraints and allow these things to be central for springs. And that will allow us to see what the dynamics of these are. So the square lattice in itself satisfies it, but I can distort the square lattice to something like this, for example. Now I still have the same number of bonds, but a different geometry. And the different geometry is going to influence the nature of the modes that we've got. So here is the Kagame lattice. Again, you have, it, it has hexagonal symmetry, but each site has four neighbors. And you can distort this lattice to this simply by, you know, relatively twisting these two triangles towards each other on, on all, uh, isotropically all around. And this is what I'm going to call the twisted Kagame lattice. And we're going to find that there are really uh, striking differences between the mechanical behavior of these two systems, even though they both fall under this uh, criteria of dn equals nc. There are three dimensional versions of it. A good one is the pyrochlor lattice here, where you connect uh, tetrahedra together. So you have six bonds coming into each site, and each site has three degrees of freedom. So again, we satisfy this z equals 2d fix. So these, these lattices are going to, are uh, elastically stable, but they, well, it depends. It depends on whether they're elastically stable or not. This one is elastically stable, but this one isn't. So they're marginally stable, you can say, and they separate floppy materials that fall apart or you know, can flop all around like, uh, I don't know, tinker toys from actually uh, mechanically stable systems. Let's see, I have to do this down here, right? Now, I'm gonna show you a, a wonderful simulate, this is in simulation, that this is, I'm gonna show you a uh, actual mechanical structure constructed by Xiaoming Mao, my former postdoc, who's now an associate professor at the University of Michigan. Uh, I'm gonna show you what we predict on the basis of a fairly simple theory that is actually a little astonishing. So this is a movie that's gonna take uh, four or five minutes, I think, yeah, here we go. So we're gonna make a material which is a, this is the Kagame lattice, but we've cut it. So now I no longer have periodic boundary conditions and I have fewer constraints than there are sites, uh, than D. In other words, I, I have uh, that the number of constraints is less than twice than D times the number of degrees of freedom. And you can see that there's a soft mode. You can, you can push in the edges and it, it, it doesn't give any resistance. Now this particular lattice, they can change the geometry by shearing it and go from what I called the previous geometry was the simple twisted Kagame lattice, which I showed earlier. And now they're distorting this so that the ratio of the sides is a little bit different and you're going to see a different behavior. So watch what happens here. They've adjusted it like this. And now there's, it's a little hard to tell with this, and I'll discuss it more later, but there's actually a polarization direction with this. In other words, going this way is different from going backwards. This thing has a kind of a geometric uh, polarization, if you wish. And we'll see that it constitutes a different topological class. Now watch what happens here. You push on this. It doesn't invaginate. It just moves the whole thing. This side is rigid. But now he's going to go to the other side. And when he pushes on it, it's even easier to push in than it was before. So what's happened in changing the geometry of this system is that we've moved a soft mode over here to the other side, leaving this side rigid. 
So now that's something that, that you know, a property which we don't see in nature, unless you have some kind of a hybrid structure where you have a sponge at this side, and a piece of metal at this side. Okay, so now I think I need to go to the next one. Now, so one of the structures that we predicted was this distorted uh, pyrochlor lattice. And the, the theoretical prediction is that this three-dimensional structure behaves in the same way as the two-dimensional structure. There's a top surface that becomes soft when it enters this uh, topological state and a bottom surface, which is rigid. So one thing to notice about this system now is if I cut it down the middle or anywhere, then I will expose a surface, which is the same thing as the one below. So here's a system that's soft on the top, rigid on the bottom. And if I cut it in half, I will still have the bottom is, is uh, rigid and the top is soft. Now, this is the material that, that was actually created by a group at, uh, at uh, the Technik Hochschule in Zurich. Uh, it has this pattern here. It, it reproduces this pattern. In other words, having uh, tetrahedra, which have a distorted shape, that are connected to nodes. And this was made with a tube gun uh, 3D printer where they have a very hard polymer here, which gives me a rigid, um, you know, a rigid strut, and then a much weaker polymer at the nodes so that there is only a residual bending force. So the experiment they performed was to push on the top and bottom surfaces and to measure for a given force or a given load how far the indentation is. So, so when you, you, know, you, you stick the, uh, you know, a pole into one side, it'll cause the surface to invaginate and you can measure how, how deeply it goes. And you can look at the difference. So what load does it take for a given indentation? So on the bottom surface, this reddish orange thing, you have the load versus indentation grows like this, whereas the, in, the load versus indentation for the top surface is much lower. So this says that I really do have a polarization between the top and bottom surface. They have different mechanical properties. Now, if this were the ideal system where I didn't have any bending forces, then this curve would go all the way down. To, uh, one of the curves, yeah, the soft curves would go all the way down to the bottom. No, it's the, the other, yeah, that's right. The soft one would go all the way down to the bottom and this, this one would have some, would really resist completely. Um, So what I'm going to be telling you, so we, I, I've named these lattices Maxwell lattices after Maxwell who was interested in them. And we're going to be studying things like their phonon spectrum, uh, the surface modes, et cetera. So the structures we create, depending upon the geometry of them, they will either have a gapped spectrum where everywhere except the origin, we're talking about phonons now, so there are um, acoustic phonons whose energy of zero wave number is zero, but otherwise all of the energy is finite. Or we have some systems where the bulk phonon spectrum actually has lines of zero modes, which are induced by the symmetry of the system, if you wish. We will find that there are modes of zero energy at free surfaces. We just saw examples of that. And that the topological properties of the gapped bulk phonon spectrum determine the number of zero modes at specific free surfaces and buried domain walls. So this is again, exactly the sort of behavior you have in the electronic system where the topological properties of the electronic band structure tell you property, tell you things about what happens to electronic states on the surface. So rather than having electronic states, you know, we have mechanical states. If we change the topology of the system, in other words, change from one topological class to another, we will move zero modes from one, on the surface from one surface to the opposite surface, where we, uh, so, so we, we can create rigid and super soft opposing surfaces. Uh, we will look at, um, oh, all right. so, Another thing that comes out of all of this analysis is that there are individual modes, which are called guest modes, 
which have a nonlinear elastic mode of zero energy. In other words, they have a, not, a zero energy, not only for in, infinitesimal displacements, but for macroscopic distortions of the system. And we can also create lattices, which have localized zero modes, which in the electronic literature are called vial modes. These are points in the spectrum where the energy goes to zero, which isn't determined by the translational invariance that gives you the phonons at, at zero wave number. Um, now, unlike the electronic states where you know, the zero of energy is usually taken to be the uh, Fermi energy, here we have a really honest to goodness defined zero, which is the state for which there's no displacement. And we can find that there are zero modes in the bulk that actually have zero energy and they have all kinds of exotic properties. So now we can go here. So the outline, I'm going to first introduce you to a really uh, remarkable theorem, mathematical theorem, which we can sort of prove in, in a couple of lines called the maxwell calladine Index Theorem. It's an interesting history to this. I found out about it in a visit to uh, Cambridge University. I was giving a talk uh, about an earlier version of this problem and uh, there's a professor in the audience who said, oh, you made a mistake there. And I went to his office and he told me about this maxwell calladine theorem, which basically it, it, it's, a, it's an index theorem, which you see in, in other contexts in supersymmetric uh, field theories, for example, have, have this uh, index. But it was invented by uh, the engineers, uh, mechanical engineers at Cambridge at a time when physicists were looking at um, what's called rigidity percolation. You know, the percolation problem is you have uh, a bunch of resistors in, in a network. And if, they, if there are enough resistors, you have electrical conductance across the whole system. You cut the resistors until you lose the electrical resistance. And there's a mechanical version of that. And the, the mechanical engineers really beat the physicists to it. They had a much cleaner way of describing those things. So anyway, we'll, we'll look at bulk modes first in the non-topological Kagame and twisted Kagame lattices. <clears throat> and then we will look at the uh, maxwell calladine surface modes that come out of this, this uh, counting. And then we'll introduce topological lattices. How do I have to distort the lattice to get this topological behavior and look at the zero modes and at domain walls and bile points, et cetera. If there's time, I may look at a few other things like uh, mechanical graphene, or one interesting question is how do you move away from the standard uh, to, to the standard elasticity of solids? You know, if I start adding bending forces, then of course, eventually, or almost immediately, I go to a state that is, at least for small distortions, mechanically rigid. So think about it. If I have a standard material, a standard uh, you know, piece of metal or you know, this book or whatever here, it is has the same surface property at this end as it has at this end. I make one of these Maxwell lattices where I have, I just balance the degrees of freedom and, and the constraints, and I find that one side is soft and the other side isn't. But the minute I start adding next nearest neighbor bonds, this is going to go eventually to becoming a solid like this, where this side's the same as that. How does the system know how to do that? Okay, so let's, um, how am I doing for time? So here is the, the maxwell calladine count. So what Maxwell says is that the number of degrees of freedom, the number of zero modes is equal to the number of degrees of freedom minus the number of constraints. So let's look at a bunch of lattices here and see what happens. So here's a lattice where I have six sites and seven bonds. So the Maxwell count, let's say the number of zero modes is twice six, minus seven, which is equal to five. So three of those modes, the zero modes are just two translations and a rigid rotation. But this says that there have to be two more than that and you can see what they are. <clears throat> Remember there are no bending forces here so I can just shear the square from here to here and that costs no energy. Or I can take this triangle and rotate it like that. <clears throat> so here's another one. This has uh, still six, uh, nodes, but eight bonds instead of seven. So the Maxwell count would say that I have three 
rigid translations and rotations in one floppy mode or zero mode, and that's this one. Let's add one more strut. So in this case now, I have one more constraint, and so I have only three zero modes, which is correct. But now I could have taken this bond right here, and instead of putting it like this, put it over here. Now I still have the eight bond, uh, I mean the uh, nine, nine uh, constraints, the nine bonds, but now I have a zero mode. So Maxwell's count breaks down because I have this different structure here. So this uh, square is different from this one because it's possible to set up stresses in these bonds such that there's no force, that there's the, the net force on each of these sites is zero. So you can see how it is here. I put the outer squares under compression and I stretch the inner spheres or the other way around. And you can see here by, by the arrows that I can choose the, the, the tensions and, and compression and the, the, the bonds here so that the, these two forces exactly can't cancel the force going in that direction. And so what the engineers did is that they called this a state of self-stress of the system. This is a state of the lattice which can uh, support stresses without changing the shape. So what you should say is, well, okay, so Maxwell's wrong. It's not number of zeros is equal to a number of uh, degrees of freedom minus the number of constraints. It's the number of stress, zero modes minus the number of states of self-stress <clears throat> has to equal the number of degrees of freedom minus the number of constraints. And in this case, we have, um, yeah, I, okay, so, 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 so we've, we've added one state of, of self-stress and you can see that the, the counting now is that N zero, which is, um, in, in the, the DN minus NB, the number of constraints is um, equal to the number of zero modes, which is one minus the number of, uh, of constraints, which is one. And here I have the NB is equal to, to the number of bonds. Okay. So, that actually is a theorem, which you all learned when you took linear algebra. And it's worth going over this to see how we can uh, use the, the algebra to analyze the modes. So let's let U be the DN dimensional vector of displacement of the sites, F be the DN dimensional set of forces on each site, E, is the NB, NB is the number of bonds, dimensional vector of bond stretches. In other words, we're talking about central forces. So the only thing the bonds can do is to grow in length or decrease in length. And so, you know, one has a positive E and the other has a negative E. And each of those um, struts can have a tension. So that's an NB dimensional vector of bond tensions. So clearly there is a linear relation between the displacements and the stretches. It's just a geometric relation, which tells you if I tell you what all of the displacements of the sites are, I can tell you what the stretches and the bonds are. So C is an NB cross DN dimensional compatibility matrix, it's called. On the other hand, if I tell you all of the tensions in the bonds, then I can tell you the forces of the sites. And again, it's a geometrical thing. So I have now a DN cross NB dimensional vector. And you can show that these two vectors uh, uh, tensors, uh, tensors, matrices are transposes of each other. So we can, we're interested then in the meaning of the null spaces of these things. So let's suppose I have a state U such that when I operate on it with this um, operator, the compatibility matrix, I get the stretches. So if the, if it turns out that the stretches are all zero, then basically that this U sits in the null space. In other words, it's the set of displacements or the set of vectors such that when C on U is zero, that constitutes the null space of the system. Similarly, if I have <clears throat> a set of tensions which give no forces anywhere, then that, that set of tensions constitutes the null space of Q. So you know, the, the number of zero modes then are the number of vectors in the space that give me no stretches. 
So in fancy words, it's the dimension of the kernel of C or it's the null space of C. And the number of states of self-stress, if I have a set of tensions which give zero force, that's exactly the set of, uh, that's exactly the null space of Q. And so that's S then is the number of those Ts, that's the uh, null space of Q. And you can prove that the null space of, of a uh, matrix and the null space of the transpose matrix have the same rank. In other words, the, the, the ranks of these two things are C and the, the rank, which is the uh, rank is, is well, it's the complement of that. That the rank of the of the uh, of this matrix C plus the number of zero modes. That's the dimension of the null space is equal to D n, and the other way around, it's n b. You you take these two things and subtract them, and you get n naught minus s is D n minus n b, which we just learned. So this is going to be an important tool as we count and look at how the zero modes go. Incidentally, the dynamical matrix whose uh, eigenvalues are the uh, modes of the, the well, non modes of the system uh, is just the spring constant of the springs times C dagger C or Q Q dagger. And C is in a sense, the square root of the dynamical matrix. So here we go. Now, the nice thing about the, the uh, periodic systems that we've been looking at is that the maxwell calladine theorem applies for every wave number. Because again, I have a matrix C, which depends upon Q when it operates on the displacements of the wave vector Q. This gives me the uh, set of displacement uh, uh, stretches at wave number Q and the similarly for the tensions and the forces. So this tells us then that the number of zero modes per wave vector Q minus the number of states of stress self stress per wave vector Q is just the dimension times the number of sites in a unit cell minus the number of bonds in a unit cell. So this tells us that for our Maxwell lattices, where the number of degrees of freedom is equal to the number of constraints, that will give us then, because we have this generalized maxwell calladine theorem that says the number zero modes minus the number of states of self-stress is dn minus nb. So this tells us that in these periodic Maxwell lattices, the number of zero modes is equal to the number of states of self-stress. And then when we start you know, cutting the lattices, we'll change these numbers and we'll be able to count zero modes from that. So here are the lattices I'm going to be looking at. The, again, the, the uh, untwisted Kagame lattice. So this is showing a zero mode, which I'll explain a little bit more in a second, that breaks the straight lines. But the, the, the generic Maxwell, uh, uh, honey, uh, excuse me, Kagame lattice has a set of straight lines of bonds going like this, oops, going like this in three different directions. So let's think about these straight lines of bonds sitting on a cylinder that closes. Then as I go around, I have a circle that closes and I can put tensions in all of the springs attaching these things without having any forces on the bonds because this, this bond pulls that way, that bond pulls the other way. So each side has zero force. So I have here a number of, um, states of self-stress that, um, <clears throat> that Q equals zero. So, so each line, each line gives me a zero mode. I, it gives me a state of self-stress. And by the theorem that the number of states of self-stress equal the number of, of uh, uh, zero modes, we have to have a zero mode for each line. And this shows a depiction of what the zero mode from the straight line going down here is. So that tells me that when I go and I calculate the phonon spectrum, I better have a number of zero modes, which is proportional to the number of straight lines, which basically is related to the perimeter of the system because I have, you know, as I go along here, I have a zero mode for each line going like this and each line going the other way. And sure enough, when I calculate the spectrum of the system going from gamma to M, I have this zero mode going from gamma to M here. You would not expect that on a standard solid. Or looking at the 
spec the phonon spectrum frequency this way as a function of wave vector in the plane, what we have are these knife edges going along the symmetry directions in the plane. Tom, I have a question. So, yeah. so can you remind me what, what are guest modes? Uh, we're going to get to guest modes in a minute. Okay, I, I'll show you some pictures of those. I also have a question. So are you keeping the, the next, the first uh, neighbor's uh, bond to be rigid or- No, 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 now, now, now what like... we're doing is looking at the phonon spectrum of central forces. Okay, so you're considering the, the next neighbors and near next neighbors, right? First and second. No, neighbor. no, right now I still keep exactly the same structure of nearest neighbor bonds only. I've replaced them with central force springs. Okay. Okay. Then we will ask what happens when we add. So let's add next nearest neighbors now. Now we have states of self-stress all over the place and this zero mode gets lifted down here to this mode. So this, this is the spectrum of this lattice with the next nearest neighbor forces now. This zero mode gets raised up and I have a standard phonon. Now let's look at this thing where I have twisted it. I now have lost all of the straight lines which allow the system to have a state of self-stress. So I've lost all of the, you know, I no longer have any uh, states of self-stress except those having to do with the whole sample. Uh, and so this guy, I no longer have a number of zero modes which equals to the number of stress. And so this guy, which had zero modes, when I twist it, it gets its uh, phonon spectrum lifted to a finite value. So the bulk phonon spectrum of this guy, which looks floppy as I'll get out, is actually gapped everywhere. So I went from having, you can see here, I have a V-shaped spectrum. That's this blue line. Now I twist it and what happens, I get this red spectrum. And for those of you who come from the electronic world, what does that look like? Anybody want to help me out? Gapped. Gapped. It looks like, well, it, it looks exactly like the spectrum of the modes near the uh, special point in, in the uh, honeycomb lattice, the, the, the uh, graphene lattices, or the Sushrefer Heger model. In other words, a gap set, there, there's a, you know, a crossing of, of the modes here. And then I, I do something to it and I you know, go to a gap system and I have different behavior. So this, this is what convinced me that there was topological behaviors in these systems, but it took me a long time to convince my electronic colleagues that that was the case. So now the guest mode. The guest mode here is pretty obvious. Once I take this and distort the lattice a little bit, I can keep on going. So I just go all the way down to here until, until the thing grows. This is a, this is a uh, you know, non-linear non zero mode of the system. And these systems will all have this behavior that, that, uh, that there is a, there's one guest mode in each of the Maxwell lattices that, that have a gap spectrum in them. So let's see, I'll go to the next one. So now let's ask what happens if I take the Kagame lattice and cut it so I turned it into a ribbon. So in the process, I cut two bonds on each of the sites coming in. So that means that now I have a, no a new number of zero modes minus a new number of states of self-stress is equal to the number of degrees of freedom, which is still the same because all I've done is to count, uh, cut bonds minus the number of new bonds that we have uh, the, the fewer bonds. This is the number of bonds in the cut system. And that's equal to the number of bonds we've cut because you know, uh, N, NB prime is NB minus delta NB. So that tells us that, uh, that S prime has to equal, so see, because DN minus NB was equal to N naught. So N naught, See, how do I want to say this, right? S prime, oh, oh I, I, I'm sorry. So, so now I ask, what is S prime? That's the number of states of self-stress of this new system. And what happens is I've eliminated two states of self-stress for each site along, uh, along the edge, because now I have no longer closed the, the cylinder 
so that I can create uh, tensions in all of these bonds and not give forces on the sites. So S prime is also is equal to S minus delta NB. And what happens then is that the number of modes is equal to the same number of modes as I had in the periodic structure, uh, but I had uh, fewer states of self-stress. Uh, so th the only way I can have the same number of modes is by having uh, zero modes along the surface. And um, no, I'm sorry, the, 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 this, <clears throat> okay, so, so, so let's go to the twisted Kagame lattice now. Now, when I cut the number of bonds, the states of self-stress stays the same. And so then I change the number of zero modes, which was not the case up here. Here, I don't change the number of zero modes. It stays the same. Here, I get more zero modes equal to the number of bonds I've cut because I don't have any, uh, the states of self-stress hasn't changed. And so what that tells us is that um, for each site going along here, I get two extra zero modes, or that amounts to two modes per wave number. And we can see what that is. So if I have uh, a, the non-topological version, which is what the twisted lat Kagame lattice is, then I should have the same number of modes on, on each side because the, the two sides are the same. And that means that I have a mode of zero energy on each surface for each wave number that comes along there. Now, what kind of waves do you have on the surface of a solid? You have Rayleigh waves. So these modes that, that we have, these zero modes that I have are zero energy Rayleigh waves. And I can ask myself, well, I forgot to tell you this back here. Notice that in the guest mode, what happens is we uh, change the volume of the system with no energy cost. And what does that mean? That means the bulk modulus is zero. It costs no energy to do a volume change or an area change. Um, So what I can do is go and ask myself, well, so suppose I have a crystal now or a solid whose bulk modulus is zero. Then what is the nature of the mode that I have? Well, that I'll have a displacement uh, U, which goes like, which decays into the Y direction and is periodic along the X direction. I thought I corrected this. Yeah, no, this is correct. So when I go to the long wavelength limit, my, my lattice should have exactly the same mode that a, um, uh, a, a continuum elastic solid has with a bulk modulus that vanishes. And sure enough, every one of our curves of the penetration depth here, the QX, Y terms. So, so this, this, this be, is an exponential. This is the inverse penetration depth. And this is the, uh, you know, the wave vector along the surface, which is along Y. It depends upon QY. And as we go down to QY equals zero, we all of the uh, different modes for uh, different values of the, of the twist angle uh, asymptote to the continuum project, projection, the continuum calculation, which uh, you can find in Landau and Lifshitz, for example. So we now see that we have a set of zero modes which obey the counting rules, which are associated with the, uh, <clears throat> boy, ah, I have a little bit to drink here. Uh, with the guest mode and the uh, bulk spectrum. So the question then is how do we create a lattice which has different properties? So rather than starting from the full Kagame lattice, we start from this lattice where we only have the states of self-stress going in one direction. And along that direction, you have an associated set of zero modes, which run along the direction perpendicular to that. And what we do is to create two different versions of this lattice, one by taking the site here, moving it down at every site, and the other taking the same site and moving it up. And it turns out that these two states have different topological structure. And that's what we wanna see now, what happens when, when you have that different structure. 
So in exactly the same way that you calculate uh, index numbers in the electrical case, we can act, calculate the number of zero modes at each wave number for a surface whose normal is a reciprocal lattice vector of the system. So you do an integral around Z of the log of the determinant of the surface um, compatibility matrix. So, you know, those are things which I can construct by looking at the surface. Z is this e to the t 2 pi i p over G, and ZQ is the 2 pi i q over GQ. So this is telling you the P is the direction into the, the surface, into the solid, and Q is the direction parallel to the surface. And you can show then that this number, the number of surface modes is the reciprocal lattice vector telling you what direction this, the surface is dotted into a, uh, a topological vector, topological polarization RT, plus a correction term, which is associated with the surface and then how you've defined your unit cell. So this RT is a topological number, which is done uh, Uh, wait a minute now, what am I saying? I'm gonna make sure I got this, this right. It's uh, th this, this, this number is equal to a, uh, a calculation. Okay, let, let, let me say this first. It's actually a little bit confusing. So, so, so there's a gauge in th th there, these, this, these numbers are not gauge invariant, but the combination is. So let me tell you what RT and RL is. So RT is this number calculated from a reference unit cell in the sample. So for example, this one here where you have sort of a symmetric arrangement of the bonds. The surface number of surface zero modes is calculated using a unit cell, which is compatible with the surface. So what you need in order to get this number is to understand how to convert this bulk reference uh, unit cell to the surface unit cell. So for example, if I look at this unit cell on the surface, that corresponds to what I see right here. You can see that uh, I, in order to get from here, the reference cell to here, the surface cell, I have to take this, bond and move it up to there, this bond and move it up to there, and that crosses things. So, so what I've done is I've moved two bonds and then I have to move this, this site over to there to get this structure. And, um, oh gee, I, I didn't, oh, wait, wait, wait just a second. I thought I had changed this. Oh yeah, okay, so that's on the next one. The, the RL, which is, has to do with the, the changing the, the unit cells is the sum over sites over the displacement of the site that I have to do to get it into the surface site minus the, the displacement of the bonds to get it to the surface site. And the, the topological uh, uh, number here, RT, is calculated on this. So going through all of that, you can see that you can get a different number of zero modes, which depend upon what the RT is and how you have to transfer the, from one to the other. And so for example, if we take this structure where G is like this and RT is like this, then you see that you have a big overlap, which is going to give me uh, more zero modes in this direction than going in the opposite direction where the G points backwards. So here, this is an example where I have four zero modes and this is showing the inverse penetration depth as a function of wave number on the surface. There are four, this line here basically is an acoustic one where the penetration depth, inverse penetration depth uh, goes to zero or the penetration depth goes to infinity and this is doubly degenerate. And there are the two modes here. This one is the symmetric one. The two, the two ends are the same. I have two zero modes on each surface. And here's one where I have three zero modes on one surface and one zero mode on the opposite surface. So, you know, just by fiddling around with this structure, you can get that behavior. 
You can also now put them, tie them together so that I have uh, a zero, a domain wall of zero modes or a domain wall of states of self-stress by pinning two ends together. And it's exactly the sort of thing that goes on in the electrical case. The, the uh, you know, strength of it is given by, it depends only on the, on the uh, reference uh, Matrix unit cell, which you take to be the same on both sides. I see my time is almost up. Just to give you a quick a mathematical view of how you get the, uh, the guest mode, you can write the elastic energy in terms of the six components or, or D times D plus one over two uh, independent strains that you can have in a solid. And you can express it like this. You diagonalize this, this uh, two by th three by three matrix in two dimensions or six by six matrix in three dimensions. And you can write it as a set of positive numbers times the eigenvector that goes with that number. Now you can show that the elastic energy, you, you would expect the elastic energy to depend upon the states of cell stress. And you can show that it's the affine strain where every point is, you know, the stretch is equal to um, a, number that stays the same times the, uh, you know, I mean, the easiest way to say it is if I have a, a straight line of bonds like this and I have an affine strain, they all move over like that and I don't have any wiggles along there. That's not the zero energy state, but it's, you know, so, so anyhow, you take the affine strain, you dot it into the orthonormal basis for the uh, uh, states of self-stress, and the calculation that comes out is that um, the important thing is that if I have in say three dimensions or two dimensions, I just have two states of self-stress and not three, then I don't have enough degrees of self-stress to exhaust the total number of uh, eigenvalues of the, of the elastic matrix. And so in three dimensions, you have necessarily, two dimensions rather, you necessarily have one of these K lambdas, which is zero, and that's the guest mode. And in three dimensions, there are three of those. So uh, let's see here. So in the Kagame lattice, I have three Qs, three zero modes, because I have the three different directions of the straight lines. And therefore I have three, uh, eigenvalues, and I have a stable last elastic energy exactly here. In the twisted Kagame, I only have two zero modes because I only have the two, uh, well, I have the two zero modes instead of three zero modes, which means I only have two states of self-stress, and I have to have that one of the eigenvalues is zero, and it turns out to be the bulk modulus is zero, and so the energy, I have an epsilon well, I have two, two um, shear modes which cost energy and a bulk mode which, which doesn't. If I look at the elastic energy of the, uh, of the uh, system and, and I look at the, I take epsilon xy equal to zero and epsilon xx equal to epsilon yy, that would give me a zero energy state, which we know we have. And that gives me then a, a ratio of strain along the x direction to strain along the y direction, which is minus one. And indeed, so that gives you a negative Poisson ratio, which is exactly what you get when you have a system which has a vanishing bulk modulus. So I think I've covered all of the important things. You can get uh, vial modes by having a square lattice like this. We can have uh, sort of dislocation, uh, rather vortex lines, if you wish of zero modes running along lines in a three-dimensional structure. You can have vial modes and zero modes in um, jam states where you have, you know, the, the, the well, that's a, another story, but when you have a random array of, of sites and bonds, such that dn equals nb, uh, you know, you can have the same sort of thing which we have in the periodic ones. So I think that I will not go any further here. I, overstayed my welcome. Uh, well, this is one final thing. You, you, you do the, the calculation of what happens when you turn on next nearest neighbors. In the case of the 
non-topological ones, the top two, the two surfaces are essentially the same. The zero modes follow the, you know, down at low wave number, they're the same. Uh, when I go to uh, very, very small uh, values for the next nearest neighbors, then, you know, this energy goes closer and closer to zero. When I have a topological lattice, the red side is the bottom ones where I know I have more modes. <clears throat> and as I turn on the next nearest neighbor forces, one of the modes becomes an optical mode. And then I have on, on both surfaces, I have a uh, propagating uh, acoustic surface mode. But when I go to very small values of the next nearest neighbor force, then the uh, blue, that's the top surface, has only a very small region where there is a, um, a surface mode that has the same slope as the surface mode of the bottom mode. Okay, let me stop at this point and give you a rest. Thanks a lot, Tom, for your questions. questions. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you. Okay, so now it's time for questions. Yeah. I have uh, some, but I will let others to ask first. Snowed. Th this works, this one is one talk that goes much better when, when I'm, you know, the audience is present. I've given yeah, it many, many times. And, and, and <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, the give and take like is easier. <laughs> yeah. uh, there's a question by Seth Foster. Go ahead. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, I think there may be a mistake in the um, your calculation for the in my zero work. modes. I think there may be a mistake in your in your calculation for the zero modes. If you go back a few slides. No, I don't think so. You have which closed, ones? Which ones? If you go back a few slides, you have an into a closed integral. Let me see. Go back one more, no, one more. This one, you want this one? Yeah, the ends, yeah, go back again, where you were just now. Yeah. No, no, the one before. Where the, before? Uh, the index number of surface mode slide, yeah. Yeah, number of surface zero modes. That yes. integral cannot be anything other than zero, as far as I know. Um, if you take the closed into close contour on the unit disk. No, no, I, I think Written may be wrong. This this number is is correct. This is I mean, the number, huh? I mean the integral that calculates it. Uh, no, I think this. Uh, no, that this is is right. Uh, well, what's wrong? What? The where you have the integral uh, around the closed unit disk dz that equals zero. So the whole thing will be zero. I think some. But so, so so you know the in, in the vicinity of the zero modes, this goes like a a z minus uh, a log, you know, near the zero mode on the surface, I have a z minus z naught. So I do d by z z of log of z minus z naught. I get a one over z minus z naught, and I'm counting the pole. You count the pole. Right. It's hard to hear. It can be an integer with need not be zero. That's right, because you know th th this is counting. Basically, it's counting the number of of, of zero modes, uh, the, the number of poles minus the number of zeros. And when you go to the surface, the it's it's all poles. When you use the surface uh, unit cell, uh, I, th I think you usually put one over z or something like something to. Something to well, one function. over z, I mean, d by dz of log of z minus z naught is one over z minus z naught. Oh, well, then the, the dz should be at the end, then. It shouldn't be within the what? end of the equation. The dz should be? Should be at the end of the equation. It shouldn't be in the, it shouldn't be in the, it shouldn't be stuck in the middle there, I don't think. I think it's the same. No, I, I, I take d by dz of the log of the determinant. The determinant will have, though this goes to zero, when I have a zero mode. So I have a Z minus some Z naught, D by DZ of a log of that is one over Z minus Z naught, and then I get the, the surface center. I, I, I count the pole. 
I have a question. Yeah. Um, you're using the word topological in, this, in the sense that it gives you an integer index in the, here, right? I'm sorry, the... You're using the word uh, topological in the, because you get an integer number here? Yeah, I do. The, the, this this right. is an integer. So uh, is, is there any sense of the, uh, in saying protection? Uh, what can I do? Like, can I snip a few bonds and then still preserve this zero mode? Um, what kind of deformation? Well, so so, so okay. th this is, uh, uh, so I, I can do any of the um, uh, guest modes on this and um, I will, you know, I, I preserve that. So any distortion of, of that lattice that, uh, well, you know, there's a phase diagram, which I haven't, which, uh, you know, I haven't drawn here, but, you know, th there are many versions of the distortion. Let, let's see, let me go back to here. So the, the, a way to think of it is let me look at this lattice and now I can come along and change the amount by which I move this up and down. And as long as I don't cross this line, all of these, will have the same, same uh, topological properties, the, the same surface, number of surface modes, et cetera. Right. So, so I mean, I, I haven't, it, it probably is also uh, robust, uh, yeah, it is robust against doing random mo motions of this, as long as I don't destroy, as long as I don't introduce a bunch uh, of, of states of self-stress, that separate the two things. In other words, if, if I distorted this so I hit states of self-stress, then I would no longer have the, uh, you know, the topologically protected modes. But the modes are protected certainly to moving this guy up and down. And I, I think uh, I'm, I'm, I have to check that, but I'm pretty sure that we checked that it, it's also true that if I move this one this way and that one that way, and I don't introduce any states of self-stress, self -stress, I will still have the zero mode count that's the same. Right, but uh, if I was to add a slight uh, nonlinearity, could you uh, nonlinearity? Then could you? Uh, are you saying that the heat transport would be directional uh, along these soft modes? If we, can you add a bit of nonlinearity to? Well, I, I mean, the calculation is certainly a linear for linearized displacements. Uh, right, it's not. You know, there are some nonlinearities you can add, and some people have, have looked at that, but that, that's, that's a little more complicated problem. So if you add a k cube to the spring constant, it would destroy yeah. it? Yeah, no, th this, is, this is clearly a, uh, a linearized theory, yeah. Right, but would it destroy it entirely, this idea of the soft? No, but, but the zero modes, zero the, modes. the interesting thing is that the zero modes really are, are uh, that they are, more, yeah, uh, the question is how, how far can I, yeah, the, 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 the zero modes could go beyond, okay, I, I don't want to make the spring, how should I say it? it yeah, the, the way it is now, for every Q vector along this, this line, yeah. I have a zero mode which tells me that I can make an indentation, a linear indentation of, of arbitrarily point-like. In other words, I can take this, this one point right here or this one and move it in. Whoops. Be because I have enough degree, I have enough zero modes along here that I can localize it to a site on the, just, just one site on the surface for the linearized theory. The nonlinear theory, uh, once you, start stretching the springs to a nonlinear force, then, then that's, that's more complicated. So, um, you know, even over here, when, when I talked about the, the zero modes in the bulk, they, they are also linearized modes because, you know, if I try to move this, this guy upward a little bit, I will eventually start stretching these bonds. So, so it's, it's only an order, a, a linear order, that's true. 
so at the uh, last question so, so at the end when you were talking about the jamming uh, yeah. i mean it just flashed that slide so there also you study linear displacements is it linearized displacements yeah in a jammed system in a right. jammed system. yes yeah right okay. well yeah the, I mean, the interesting thing about the jamming is that you know what do people typically do when they would do calculations? You take a, an arrangement like this under periodic boundary conditions. So you have you know, a large number of sites and basically the calculation that's done is to look at the uh, structure where the, <clears throat> the periodic, you periodically repeat the same structure. So that's really just like looking at the Q equals zero modes of a very large unit cell. And the, you can arrange the same number of particles in different ways. You know, when you build these jamming structures, uh, you, you, there are many ways of, of putting things together. And it turns out that those different ways give you a different number of zero mode counts on the two sides. So you might, you could characterize jamming systems by the difference in the number of zero modes on the, on the two ends. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Doc. Joel, you, uh, there is a question from Joel Gustin. Joel, I have done. Okay, uh, question is: If you look at uh, the thermal properties, like specific heat, do you see anything interesting or anomalous for these uh, meta metamaterials? Um, so yes, um, what happens when you heat them up? is that, that they actually become uh, rigid. So let me see if I can remember how this goes. Um, oh, golly, I just, I have to, uh, we actually wrote a paper on this and I can't, I can't remember the details now. There, there's an interesting phase diagram that, um, oh shoot, how does it go now? Yeah, uh, I, I can send you a paper about it. I, 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 my, my, slips my mind now as to exactly how, I, I know we did a very clever thing that, um, you know, basically what happens is, is the, the temperature gives you a rigidity to the system. Ah, okay. We did this as, you know, four or five years ago, and I don't remember the details. But 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 there are interesting things that happen. You know, it influences. You you have these uh, open systems where you have a thermal conductivity that, um, you know, isn't isn't the expected linear, in, uh, you know, T cubed or whatever it is, and it, it differs because you're you're near a, a critical point at zero temperature. Um, and if I can, only could remember the model that we used, uh, what was the model we used? Oh, I know, I know what, what, what it was. We, we took a model where we took a square lattice and put next nearest neighbor bonds in the square lattice. And so now you can have the next nearest neighbor bonds so that they, um, <clears throat> that they, you can imagine that make a five fourth theory for the, for the next nearest neighbor bonds. So that at one end you have that they have a one preferred length and then you move along a parameter space and then you have two equivalent preferred lengths and there's a critical point in the middle. At the critical point, you have one of these Maxwell lattices because you, you, um, you, you made it nonlinear in a way that you don't see at the linear order. And then you go to the other side and you have these soft modes and the temperature uh, stiffens the soft modes and you have a system whose elasticity is uh, proportional to the temperature. You know, the rigidities are to some power of the temperature. 
so, so, so the, the, the guest mode that we have is stabilized because of, of the, the thermal fluctuations. Mm -hmm. Gustavo, go ahead. Mm -hmm. So starting from the Skagomelatis, uh, after some deformation, we actually see some chiral tiling, right? After this deformation, and we, we start seeing the topological properties. What happens if you start with a, a tiling that it does not satisfy this uh, Maxwell condition? For instance, there is this snub uh, square tiling on, on the plane that you, you do with uh, squares and equilateral triangles in such a way that you can do it either like left-handed or right-handed. But in that case, each uh, site ha uh, has, I think, five nearest neighbors. So that's a stable, that, that would be stable. Okay, so you, the, even though it's, it's not fully, you still have like some wiggle because it's not sick. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, it's neighbors. Still, it, it, yeah, it, it has, you know, unless, uh, unless you've chosen some particular form that, that might be sloppy, but it, it has uh, five neighbors per site and it will be stable. Now, now some of those, those exotic, lattices actually can be quite interesting. Um, they will do f funny things. Now we looked at one which was, uh, oh golly, I've forgotten the details of this one also. Um, you know, there are some, uh, there, there's something called the, yeah, the, the, the dice lattice. So the dice lattice is one where you have sort of two inter interpenetrating uh, a square lattices, I guess. How does it go? I've, I've forgotten the details of how that looks. It, it's something where, where it, there are models where, where, you, where you get uh, four, uh, average coordination of four by alternating threes and fives. I see. That, you know, it, you can use that analysis for, for remember the analysis I just gave for that, that system. Of course, you have more sites per unit cell so you you know it, it, the things get a little bit messier, but but indeed you will have uh, you know basically the same store. And even random versions of that. You know we did we did quasi crystals for example. So quasi crystals, some of the quasi crystals tilings are um, are uh, you know Maxwell lattices. And of course, you don't have a unit cell there. So what, what we did was to look at their particular uh, tilings where you can periodically repeat a uh, quasi-crystalline motif. And, yeah. Okay. So thanks a lot, Tom, for this wonderful colloquium. Yeah. My apologies to the audience that uh, found it too technical. No, no, it's it's a lot of fun. And uh, we will have you over again. We won't count it as a colloquium since you live close by. Yeah. Right. Okay, okay. thanks a lot. And okay. Thanks. Now the complicated process of getting me out of here. Oh, okay, there we go. Good. We'll enjoy your time and we'll be in touch over the other issues that yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, thanks a lot for your time time yeah. this time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Bye bye. Let me I need to find